I'll let you introduce yourself. It ain't that hard. No? Laklowski? See, he did it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce myself, Flip, and Brian. We've worked together for about 20 years, and we have a certain amount of experience that is relevant to the question of how in the world are we going to address the data problem of blockchain. Uh, the programming layer has been addressed to some degree. It's been addressed by folks like Ethereum. Now, I do want to give you some context to the comments that I'm about to make. I've got about seven years in the blockchain space. Three companies that I have been closely associated with, many, many others as an advisor or investor through Tally Capital and uh, Silk Road Equity. So we've seen a lot. The three companies that I am most excited about, number one is Unocoin, which is the exchange in India, kind of the coin base of that region. Two is Veriblock, which is a way of borrowing blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain security from Bitcoin and deploying it in nascent blockchains. Fundamental pieces of architecture. And then the most exciting one is the data layer, which we'll talk about today. Okay. That data layer is the equivalent of what Ethereum provided. what Ethereum provided as the programming layer. Now, I gotta give you two other little stories, little vignettes. One is, if you think in terms of how far are we into the phenomenon of blockchain, there is no precise answer. We will only do the, be able to answer that question in kind of historical context one day. But I can tell you that it appears to me to be very, very early. In fact, if you were to equate Ethereum with a, another phenomenon, I would say that it's probably about the equivalent of VisiCalc. We've just discovered the programming layer. Not that Bitcoin didn't have a little bit of that, but it was improved, and that was the improvement of the spreadsheet and the PC, introduction of the PC era. And I think we've got a whole host of variations, improvements of infrastructure. What excites me about the fact of blockchain is that the infrastructure needs to be built out and the infrastructure is really the neatest part of the equation. One day, that infrastructure, if it's just right, will allow people to use blockchain without knowing it's blockchain. I'll give you one other vignette. I remember in 1968 walking into my first IT job at Time Incorporated and seeing two, three floors of computing equipment, my only response in 1968 to what I saw was, shit, I wish I had gotten into this stuff earlier. And now it's 50 years from then, and it still goes on. So that's the beauty of these kinds of technologies. So now that you've kind of heard about the data layer being our focus, the most exciting period of what, I th of what I think is my blockchain connections is Flurry. This is where I put my passion, my time, my energy. Uh, and it is certainly where the brilliance of my partner, my co-founder, uh, Brian Platz is. And so I turn it over to him. We'll kind of ham and egg it when appropriate and uh, cover the topic. Thanks, Flip. Yeah, so we're obviously really excited about blockchain technology, and we've seen some really incredible successes with it, like the cryptocurrencies, you know, Bitcoin. Our focus in our history is really on enterprise software, and one of the things we know we need to make happen for uh, this technology to really reach its full potential is obviously around just general usability. How, to, how do we enable developers to start leveraging this technology? And like they can pick up and you know, code a web page today or do some of these things. And if you remember not too long ago, those things were incredibly difficult. Um, so we think we're at the very early stage of this. And one of the issues that we aim to address is certainly how do we manage the full data set around applications as we're building uh, business apps. And there's a ton of hurdles for this right now. Like Flip said, we're really, really early, but these are kind of some of the, the three big ones. When we talk to people, 
How are uh, they going to leverage this technology in some of the tooling or applications that they're currently using? And the biggest one that we usually hit first is this idea of architectural misfit. You know, our, our app developers, the people who are building applications, this is where all this value happens in the IT space and business, they're used to building applications in a certain way. There's, you know, this three-tier architecture we've been using for now decades to do things. And blockchain technology works very, very differently. And trying to stitch these things together for people become actually quite a challenge. And some of the tooling's improving, but it's a pretty significant challenge and it actually turns off a lot of projects at that stage. It's just too much to learn. Uh, there's things that can happen in blockchain, like you can get a confirmation that a transaction happened and then turn around and one minute later find out it really didn't happen. We have orphan blocks all the time. I think Ethereum has almost 10% of their blocks, I think, are orphan, where things happen, but they didn't really happen. You find out later they didn't happen. And you can imagine in a business context, you know, if I'm going to issue an invoice, like I would never expect it to not have happened or to learn that maybe it didn't happen or I terminate an employee or something like that. So there's this, this uh, you know, difference, this big difference. So how do we bridge that difference? Uh, obviously, another challenge is this uh, specialization. So most of the blockchains that are out there are highly specialized, and you know we're going to talk about data, obviously, and a lot of people consider them kind of big, slow databases, which to a certain degree they are, except they're so specialized that they're databases that can only store like four or five pieces of information, and that you can only ask questions to or sort of query in a couple very specific ways. They're not a database like a MySQL or an Oracle that we can actually use as the underpinning of the applications that you're probably all using every single day. I'm going to interrupt with a question to you folks, and that is how much does it cost to store one gigabyte of information on Ethereum? Millions. That is not an acceptable condition in high volume applications. No, so it, it's no real attack against Ethereum either, because Ethereum didn't set out to solve that sort of problem. It, it set out to solve the smart contract more the app tier, business logic tier of the problem. And then the other issue we run into, of course, we'll talk a little bit about now, is this idea that we don't have a good storage solution. So these enterprise applications have a lot of data to them. So this is kind of what a lot of our blockchain technology out there really excels at it. It might be hard to use, but it excels at this. At least I believe it excels at this. The idea that I have you know, two users, two accounts, two whatever, and I'm moving some sort of asset, and we can put smart contracts in the middle and do some really interesting multi-sig or escrow sort of things. We can do a lot of interesting things with this uh, technology. But when we're building business applications, there's all of this other stuff that happens around this. So this is just a transaction. We have an entire application that maybe even just around moving these assets, there's photos, descriptions, who did it, what was the approval process, and some of that we can put on the blockchains today, uh, especially if that data is minimal, but a lot of typical business applications, this isn't the case, and this is really where a lot of this divide is happening, because now I need to store all this somewhere, and where that's typically going today is into a MySQL database, or you know, into a MongoDB or something like that. But now I sort of have this disconnect. I got some of the stuff that happened on-chain and some off-chain and they're somehow connected, but almost what's the point of putting the on-chain stuff on there if I need the off-chain stuff to be able to even know what the on-chain stuff is. Uh, and we see this a lot, uh, but we're, we're kind of in the early days. So this is our approach. Um, you know, there's several approaches out there and we're happy to answer questions or talk about several of them. But how do we kind of pull this together? So our approach was we're going to build an entirely new database from scratch. Uh, we're going to build it with incredibly modern features, things that we wish we had in the databases that we've been using for 30 years, like in Oracle or MySQL, but seem practical to include today. But let's have this other side of the database and be able to have the notion of the data that's transacted can, optionally, doesn't have to, can, undergo some form of distributed consensus. So right now when we update data in the database, which is updated, as long as I have permission to the database, I can update it. But what if instead we're trying to update information in the database, but that actually has to go through some form of distributed consensus. So for us, we're a, a full asset compliant blockchain database. So the blockchain side, of course, we structure our data as an immutable ledger. We have this notion of hybrid consensus. We'll talk about that in a moment. 
And on the database side, we structured it as a graph style database because we think that that's where databases are going. Uh, we've built in a bunch of new interesting features, like I mentioned, and certainly one of them is time travel, the idea that you can actually query the database but optionally issue that query at any point in history and get an instantaneous response. It's like having a backup in everything. Uh, and we do some really neat things with this in the, our sample apps. We actually allow you to rewind entire web-based applications at any point in time. So there's a lot of really interesting, useful features. And we tried to structure it in a way that people just app developers understand, which is this typical architecture. You've got a client here, an app here. App here can be, you know, a, a Java app, a .NET app, or it might be Ethereum or Hyperledger Fabric. You know, we sort of consider those at the app tier stage. And then you have a data tier where you're storing the information. Uh, the key here, though, is that these different databases can optionally be participating in consensus outside of your network with your supply chain partners. Uh, we even have a full version of public consensus that we're looking to release later in the year where anyone can launch a, a global public database. Uh, and what we're able to do is we're actually able to aggregate that data, which might all be happening in different consensus modes, and present it to your applications as a single database. Uh, so it makes it so easy for app developers that are just kind of used to dealing with this. So I can just use a database how I use a database, but I can optionally add in blockchain consensus to some of that, uh, to solve some of these sorts of problems. Uh, so at a high level, this is kind of what we built and where we focused on. I know we wanted to leave some time uh, for questions about uh, just storage in general on the blockchain or what specifically we built. To put something into a little more colorful uh, platter, you could probably look at it from the standpoint of the programmatic light layer that Ethereum has. Um, uh, provides for a smart contract to be deposited, it is there. You can draw it out if you know the key. But wouldn't it be nice if you could query all of the contracts that are present, that are yours? Okay. We'll go to Q&A. <laughs> Yeah, someone, someone somebody's going to pick somebody in QA. Just so you know, uh, in my career, uh, Ryan and I worked at a couple of places together, but I, I started a company called Platinum Technology. It was a database-centric business. It got to a billion in revenue, sold it for $4 billion in 1999. It's just one piece of uh, the kind of technological connection that we have historically. Um, and. I'm the first one to absolutely admit that only the last six months of any experience anybody has in the IT space is relevant. Anything before that is obsolete. But out of the obsolete stuff, you sometimes pick up a gem here and there that gives you the forecast of what might happen going forward. And I certainly believe wholeheartedly, as Brian does, that in the future, all blockchain development will probably be done in something like Flurry. I think we do have one quick. We have one quick question. So, what difference do you, differentiates you guys between Sidecoin and their cloud storage system? Between Sidecoin, Side, uh, SIA, SIA, SIA Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So we are actually structured as a true database that you can uh, develop a schema for. You can actually write code similar. You know, it's not Solidity for like Ethereum. Uh, we have our own programming language and we have just generic ones we'll be supporting, but that's how you actually instantiate the rules inside of the database as to who can update what. So you can do situations like have multiple companies share product catalogs, but set up rules that only this company that actually owns that product or that works for this company that owns that product can update it. So you can update some other companies. Uh, product information, things like that. So this code layer in there can actually leverage the graph database to help answer those questions. So it allows multiple companies to set up a set of rules and say, hey, we're going to start sharing this information together or transacting together or doing business together in these ways. What are the rules by which we're going to do that? Codify those rules in the database itself. Now anyone submitting basically data updates it has to go through and actually approve those rules. So, you know, it's very different than like a basic kind of, uh, not, not that anything's basic, but just uh, sort of an object store or something like that. This is an actual uh, graph database. And, and one can imagine terabytes of information, many terabytes, even ectobytes, 
of information being cooperatively managed by a vast number of people trying to track environmental uh, uh, and weather patterns for certain kinds of applications. So it's, uh, it's really big data. Data that is not just important because of the data, it's because the relationship between the data gives you the answer. And many, many social media companies have come up with solutions like this one-off. For example, the Facebooks of the world and uh, you know the Instagrams and all of the folks that have big, huge data volume issues have solved this problem for themselves, but there will be databases like Flurry that will solve it on a global scale for everybody who doesn't have the resources of Facebook to write their own data manipulation environment. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much.